Welcome to discoverworship.com. Our guest today is Robert Sterling, and we're so glad you're here, Robert. Thank you. you. You're an interesting guy because a lot of arrangers I know either specialize in the choral space or they're in the artist recorded space, but you've had a a very successful career in both areas. You've won six Gospel Music Association Dove Awards. You've had eight top 10 Christian radio hits. You've produced such artists as uh, Point of Grace and the Tallies. And and then you switched over to the left side of your brain and decided to write a book about the craft of Christian songwriting and have taught literally hundreds of people how to use their songwriting talents for God. And so we're ecstatic that you're here with us today. We have a number of your uh, songs in our catalog. And so uh, that makes it especially special for us. So let's start by just telling us how you got involved in the music business and kind of your journey through it. Uh, yeah, uh, my story is unique to me, and yet it's so similar to so many other people's. And it's it was literally the music bug bit mm-hmm. when I was a kid. How old were you? Well, I started playing drums. I thought I was going to be the world's greatest drummer. Is what I thought I was. Going Ringo. To be. We all wanted to. be. No, I wanted that. to be Buddy Rich. Oh, who wow. I wanted to be. Okay. I saw Buddy that's Rich cool. on TV when I was thirteen, and I thought that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, it was high school band and all that kind of thing. And uh, somewhere along the line, it's that combination of of life, everything. I, you know, I was raised in church. My mother was a church soloist, so music was in our house all the time. I played drums for everybody in high school. I was the biggest deal in my high school. And then I got uh, a reality check when I went off to college and and, uh, discovered what real drummers could actually do. And I began to change my focus a little bit. But I began writing songs as late as, I mean, as early as late high school and got serious about it in college. And my first recorded song came when uh, I was either about to graduate from college or I was just out of college. And where did you go to school? I I finished at Baylor Mm -hmm. in Waco, Texas. I I started at North Texas State, Mm -hmm. which is a big music school. I mean, a very big music school, 2,000 music majors. Um, And I transferred to Baylor and finished up there. And and then that happened to be, at the time, Waco, Texas was the home of word music. Mm-hmm. And I began to get odd jobs, like a lot of So there were several of us. I, I happened to go to school with a group of guys and girls who ended up in the Christian music business. Dennis Worley was a mm-hmm. classmate of mine mm-hmm. who ended up being a big deal in music publishing and now as a music minister. Don Kaysen mm-hmm. was a classmate of Terrific mine. Terrific guy. Mm-hmm. And who ran Word Publishing for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And who signed me to Word Music. Wow. Uh, and Paul Smith, who ended up being one of the members of the Imperials, Imperials and then had a solo career. We were all in a group together in college. Wow. Mark Hayes, who was a big deal mm. uh, choral arranger uh, and composer. He, and, he was the last roommate I had before I got married. Wow. Yeah. So there was this little feverish group at Baylor that were all interested in the music business. And we had a mentor a guy named Charles F. Brown, Charlie, everybody called him Charlie, who ran the publishing division of Word, and Kurt Kaiser, who ran the entire music division at Word, became my mentors, and uh, and under them, I learned about this Christian music business. Now, I didn't go into that immediately. I ended up leaving Waco. We, we had started our family there, and we went to Dallas, where I wrote jingles for a decade. Wow. I wrote and produced jingles for radio and TV, and, and I was writing songs at that time. And a matter of fact, I, I was living in Dallas uh, doing the jingle thing when I got my first real cut, the Sandy Patty cut, Sing to the Lord, in 1984, mm-hmm. I think it was. And uh, But I stayed in Dallas the entire decade of the 80s, and, uh, and the jingle thing kind of ran its course. Uh, that business changed dramatically thanks to technology and things like that. And I was getting very bored with it and uh, didn't know what to do. And my best friend, Chris Machen, who was an artist that I was working with and writing with at that time, uh, said, Robert, everybody but you seems to know that you're supposed to be in Nashville. And so we made the move to Nashville in 1990. And that's when a lot of this other kind of exploded. But I had already begun doing arranging for choirs uh, just here and there, you know, uh, this publisher or that publisher would release a single piece or something like that. And 
when I came here, Word signed me within a year, and I was signed to Word exclusively as a songwriter and arranger for 17 years. Wow. Which is a long stay. That's a real long stay. Most guys Mm -hmm. rotate out after about three to six years. But it worked. It worked for Word. It worked for me. And until things changed dramatically in the business and at Word, where uh, all the people that I knew and loved there basically had matriculated out to other things, Mm -hmm. it was a great relationship. And I, I owe those folks a huge debt. And it was a great... It was a great 17 years of relative stable employment for a for someone in this business, which is a very unusual thing. That's a real blessing. It, it very really much is. so. It was those and it was those crucial years when my sons were going through junior high, high school, college, and so it helped us pay. And you know, the musician had needed to pay for two college tuitions and and two weddings and things like that. Mm-hmm. And it was mm-hmm. it was a real blessing. Wow. It truly was. So when you sit down to write a song, let's say for the church, Mm -hmm. what do you keep in mind? Uh, For the church, it's, uh, you get an idea generally. And where do ideas come from? That's, you know, you could, we could talk for hours about where an idea comes from. It can come from anywhere. But as I craft any song, I'm always thinking who's going to sing this. Honestly, whether it's a song for an artist you know, I wrote a lot of songs for the late Luke Garrett, and when you're writing for Luke, you 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 try to go, what would Luke sing? When I wrote for Point of Grace, you try to, what would they sing? So when you write for the church, you go, what do they need to sing? Wow. You know, what would they sing? Uh, then you also throw in limitations, you know, uh, for the church, there are musical limitations if you're smart, mm-hmm. that if you want something to be sung by a congregation, you keep in mind that a congregation is a bunch of really average singers. So don't write something that's got the range of the Star Spangled Banner. Right. Write something that has a very tight range and that's uh, the average guy in the pew can sing. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I I go, what could my dad sing? Wow. You know, and and you can hear me. I'm a bathroom baritone. You know, it's like I I can't sing high. Don't don't write. I don't write high notes when I want the... uh, the average guy to be able to sing it. You think about things like that. And also, you know, uh, Christian songwriters have got all the burdens of the craft burdens and limitations that every songwriter has, you know, whether you write pop music or country music or theater music or whatever, but Christian songwriters have to concern themselves with theology. And uh, I was, I was raised in a Southern Baptist house. And so I was at church on Wednesday night and Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon and, and Sunday night and all that. And I had pretty good Bible teachers and preachers that were that helped me. I didn't realize that I had a pretty solid theological foundation. But um, I've got a couple of pastor friends that I call my, my theology rabbis. Whenever I've got something in a song that I'm going, am I a little off here? Am I, am I stretching? you know, the biblical truth, I'll run it past my, my friend Gene Wilkes mainly, who's a head of a seminary in Dallas, and he'll look at it and go, yeah, this is good, or you, you, know, you might want to think about that. Wow. You so know. it's not only about craft, but it's about truth. Yeah, oh, so. very much so. I mean, um, and you know, sadly, I think there have been some songs that have slipped into the praise and worship uh, field over the last 30 years that needed to have that check done on them, and they that it didn't happen and we've had we've had some songs in church that will go nameless with us here but that that have got some I think questionable theology so it's uh, it's important to me and I don't I'm not saying I've gotten it right every time right right and I look back at older songs and I realize oh maybe I knew what I meant I what I thought I said, but maybe right. somebody reading or singing that or hearing it for the first time, hearing it a little more literally might not understand. And so I've, I've probably put more limitations on myself in the last 20 years than I did in the early going of my writing career. Well, I think that's just, you are uh, demonstrating care because we have a very precious, we have the most valuable message in all of creation, right? And so we have to, we should take great care, right, in the way we present it, You're right? So. And you want to just want to present it truthfully and accurately. Mm-hmm. Now that doesn't mean it's it has to be 
um, literal and without creativity. Right. You know, um, songwriters are not preachers. Uh, and I, I think that uh, we can make a declarative statement, but we need to make it poetically. Mm-hmm. Or I think we also need to ask more questions in our songs and allow people to under, it's like they can come to the answers the right way. Right. The whole book of Job is one big question. One big question. Yeah, that's a troubling <laughs> book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's what God wants us to do. He right. wants us to ask questions, and inevitably our quest will lead, lead us to him. Yeah, and so. I don't have a problem with uh, asking God hard questions uh, or asking hard questions of the Bible. Why is a really important question. And uh, because... I figure if something is truth with a capital T, Mm -hmm. you know, the real truth, not uh, then then questions won't bother it. Right. It it'll it it does not shy. The truth does not shy away from honest questions. And Uh, so who was that preacher who once said that that uh, the truth of the gospel doesn't need to be protected. It needs to be unleashed. Oh, I don't know. But that's great. Yeah. 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 It's it's I, I don't think it needs us to to hide parts of it or anything like that. It's, yeah. I'm comfortable with it. Yeah. You know. Well, let's talk about some of the projects that you've been affiliated with that, that you know, looking back, you've, mm-hmm. you found the most pleasure, the, the most joy. In. <laughs> what, what, um, and maybe, maybe the ones that have been most successful, just uh, remind our listeners of some of those. Well, the ones that were the most successful were not necessarily the easiest or the most fun. Ironically, the ones that were the most fun and the most joy were often the ones that were the least successful. But, that is a, that's just an axiom for the music business in general, <laughs> that things that are often the most popular and sell the most uh, have, been the, have been run through more ringers mm-hmm. and, uh, and squeezed and, and pasteurized more. And uh, because they're, you're trying to reach a really large market, uh, and so you're having to make a lot of people happy. The Point of Grace records, you know, I did. I produced the first two Point of Grace records, which were both really successful, and uh, the girls were sweethearts. I mean, they're lovely, but even they would tell you that first record, uh, both records were were hard work mm-hmm. for everybody involved, mm-hmm. because there was a new relationship with a record company, and none of them had ever done that before. Uh, They were working with me and with uh, Scott Williamson Mm -hmm. on the first record, and they didn't know us, and everybody's kind of tentative, and management was coming in every day, and executive producers were were hovering, and and there was a lot of tension. I don't think any of that shows on the records. Mm -hmm. I think that we got really great records, and it was a lot of hard work and a lot of tears with four young women who who were just barely out of college when we did that. And so, and I wasn't always the most sensitive guy in the studio back then. Um, and so that was a lot of work. I mean, it's hard work. On the flip side, possibly my m- most favorite records that I've ever produced were, were uh, one was with Kurt Kaiser. I did Kurt Kaiser's last album for Word. And it was this delightful, quiet uh, called The Lost Art of Listening, where he literally improvised 10 tracks at the piano right then and there in the studio. And then we went back in later and added ambient sound effects to them. We talked about what each one would be. And and it's this terrific listening record that nobody's heard. Wow. And, uh, and then the records I did with artists like Luke Garrett, who was arguably the most creative singer I've ever worked with. He never sang anything the same th- way twice in a row. And, uh, and his theory was that whatever was captured on the record at that time was what he felt right then. And mm-hmm. if you recorded it 30 minutes later, it would be something different. Yeah. Uh, you never had to tell Luke what to sing. You just had to con- you know, hope you captured it in the studio. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, was a remarkable voice that could uh, had almost no technical limitations, kind of like a Bob Carlyle, but I mean more inspirational. But right. you know those really huge voices that that come along from the church from time to time, Michael English and people Steve like Green, Steve yeah. Green, yeah. those guys that you, you just stand back and 
let them be them. Yeah. And working with a guy like that was a real pleasure. But I mean, Luke never sold huge numbers of records. Right. Uh, but he definitely had an impact. Oh, absolutely. And he had a real fan base in the church. Mm -hmm. And because of my background doing choral and everything, I think we made a good team uh, for that. Well, uh, Two or three of your big choral pieces. What would uh, well, my most popular choral piece by far, uh, if uh, is an arrangement I did in 1985. It's still selling. Of uh, uh, Jesus paid it all. Hmm. Uh, it, I, every time I go to a choral conference, I was just at one last week, and I'll have at least two or three guys come up and say. And when I say guys, I mean music ministers, male or female, mm -hmm. will come up and say, oh, I, our choir loves that piece. We sing it at least once a year. And uh, it has a real um, technical, impressionistic kind of piano part. This is the universal uh, sign, symbol, for piano, sign for piano, piano part piano. <laughs> um, that, uh, that church accompanists, accompanists uh, really enjoy playing. And so, uh, and it's got a big dramatic arc to it. And, and of course, in that case, the source material, the hymn itself, is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole lot of an arranger's, uh, that's, that's the arranger's best friend is good source material. Right. You know, right. when you've got great source material like that, I joke that, you know, a trained monkey could do an arrangement of it, it'd still be pretty good, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you, it's hard to top a hymn like Jesus Paid It All. And uh, the other one uh, that a lot of people have sung, it's a song that I wrote with Chris Machen in the late 80s called I Have Seen the Light that had a slow start. It's a big uh, Christmas song uh, that with, for a male trio with choir backup and had a real slow start. And then somewhere in the early 90s, uh, a choir director in Memphis at Bellevue, Jim Whitmire, I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, put it in his Christmas program. And everybody heard it, and suddenly everybody was wanting to sing this song. And now a lot, like a lot of men's groups, have covered it because of this big trio thing. Uh, the Gatlin brothers use it to close their Christmas concert wow. for the last twenty years. Mm. And uh, Gold City recorded it. Uh, a couple of three uh, Southern gospel groups have recorded it, and uh, a group called Brethren, which is this men's group out of. Uh, Washington D.C. has done. It's been recorded probably twenty or thirty times by various men's groups, and hundreds of times by choirs all over the country. Wow! Yeah, it, I mean, it's that must give you a lot of satisfaction too. Uh, it was really cool. Uh, probably uh, at least a decade ago, I was in Branson uh, for the closing of a show that I had written there, and the Gatlins had their Christmas show going across town. And their co-artists for their Christmas show were the Lennon Sisters. I oh, mean, wow. Exactly. I mean, I, I grew up... Bing Crosby Lennon right, Sisters? Right, yeah. Wow. The, the, the ones that you used to see on Lawrence Welk and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I mean, so anybody from my generation knew who the Lennon Sisters were. And so we went and went to hear their concert. And they closed the concert with I've Seen the Light, the Gatlins and the Lennons singing together. Wow. So I got to hear two iconic American family vocal groups sing my song. And what was crazy was the people around me were singing along. Oh, man. Because they knew the song. That is cool. Because they probably had sung it in church. Yeah. You know, so that was pretty neat. Thanks for listening to part one of our video blog with writer-arranger Robert Sterling. Look for part two of this interview on our site in the coming weeks.